Many times people refinance because they want a better deal. And the broker sends them a comparison and says, this is, you know, these are the rates you can get. Well, that may not be the only product you can get. That's just the one that broker is recommending due to, you know, your objectives and also due to them being comfortable using those lenders. Welcome to the Debt to Financial Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Victor Lagos, and the founder of Lagos Financial. I've been in the finance and lending industry for 16 years, and I've personally made financial mistakes and learned from them. I started this podcast to share stories and lessons on my own journey, and to share insights that may help others on their journey. And I interview people that I've connected with that share the same values and mission to help others create financial freedom. My goal with this podcast is to share raw, honest, transparent, and helpful stories that you can relate to and inspires you to take control of your finances and only have debt that brings you closer to financial freedom. All right, we are back with the Financial Freedom Series. My name is Andrew Bean, and I'm here with my man, top mortgage broker and financial expert, Victor Lagos. How are you, mate? Good, Andrew. How are you? Happy New Year. Um, Happy New Year to you, man. It's been a while, but I'm glad we're uh, back to it, even though this is the, the final episode in our Financial Freedom series. I know. I can't believe it's uh, coming to an end. It's been great. Yeah, all, all good things do have to come to an end, but uh, we've got the, the final episode coming for you right now, which is a, a top episode um, because we're basically talking about how we can refinance the property that we purchase, putting it all together so we can keep the portfolio going and buy more cash flowing real estate. So mate, can you just explain what it means to refinance your property and, and why homeowners and investors might consider doing that? Yeah, so refinancing is basically getting one loan to pay out another. And Usually, the most common reason someone would refinance is just to get a better interest rate. Um, and then that would also mean to lower their repayments. But when you're an investor, there's other objectives. It's not just about the interest rate and lowering the repayments. It's about setting up the right structures. So interest mm-hmm. only. Um, you know, It's also about extracting equity. So if you're wanting to use equity as a deposit to keep growing your portfolio, that's another reason why people would refinance. Okay, awesome. So like in terms of using equity, can you just explain, this is a conversation that I have with a lot of um, clients as well. Um, Can you just explain the um, flow and effect of using equity for an investment property, how that, you know, gets 100% financed? Yeah, so I think the general rule of thumb is to consider that even if your property is, say, worth a million dollars, you can only access 80% of it. So a million is an example, it obviously could be worth less than that or more, but a million dollars, if you were to access 80%, that's 800,000 total. So if you owed already on your mortgage, say 600,000, that means you've got $200,000 of accessible equity. So, So misconception is that people can obviously borrow the full million. Well, the equity is obviously important for the for you. That's your skin in the game. For the bank, it's obviously the risk not exceeding the eighty percent. You can go higher if you pay mortgage insurance, but when you're if you're going to access equity to buy another property, it's typically capped at the eighty percent, and that's because you've got less restrictions in how much cash you can access. And another thing, another way, um, what we call it is is cash out. So. Cash out is when you when a bank will lend you the equity as cash, so then you can use that to put as a deposit, or obviously you can use it for other things as well. But the other way around it is if you bought a property at the same time and you don't have access to the cash. That's what's called cross collateralization, and a lot of investors don't like doing that because it ties the two properties together, and it actually uh, puts it, it puts the borrower or the investor at risk. Because if one property goes up in value and the other one goes down, you can't access the equity of the one that just went up because the other one went down. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. So if you're with the same bank, you're cross collateralizing those uh, those assets. Yeah, yeah, and you can still use the same rule around the eighty percent. So say you, you know, you borrowed 
another property. So you bought another property up to say, uh, let's just use an example of 600,000. You bought a $600,000 property and you borrowed 400,000 uh, from the bank to buy that property. You still need another 200,000 to cover the deposit. So therefore, if you had equity on another property that you use as cash, that's how you end up borrowing 100% because now you've borrowed 200,000 from your existing property, 400,000 against the one that you're buying. Combined, you're borrowing the full 600K. Of course, there's stamp duty and other costs, but we can you know, account for that uh, by increasing the equity that you take. Yeah. On. Yeah. And this is the conversation that what I have with a, a couple of um, clients um, with the buyer's agency is that like, I was like, you know, that if you use equity, um, you know, you're going to be paying interest on the, the deposit, the equity that you've drawn out, and you're also going to be getting a loan for your next property. So essentially, you're 100% finance, and it's going to be very hard for that property to cash flow because um, you're literally 100% finance. So if you're only getting a 6 to 6.5% return and you're paying 7% interest rate, you are underwater. And um, it's funny that, like, I, I don't know if, like, it's just strange people don't realize that, um, that, you know, being 100% finance, that's, that's a lot of finance against that property. Yeah. I have that conversation all the time um, where people are like, yep. I ask them, you know, have you got access to a deposit? They say, yep, I've got, I've got equity. I'm like, okay, have you already got access to the cash or is it just sitting in equity? They're like, no, I've got it in equity. I'm like, all right. So that means we have to borrow the funds to use that as a deposit. So mm -hmm. therefore, the, the rent now needs to cover the interest on the, the purchase loan. Say it's a commercial property, it needs to cover that and it needs to cover the equity uh, equity loan that you're taking out to cover the deposit. So once you actually put the cash flow in to see how that looks, a lot of the time it's negative. Um, so people need to be prepared for that. But at least it's tax deductible. And of course, for commercial property, the rent will go up with fixed increases, et cetera. And also we're working off today's rates and rates will likely reduce at some point. So it's not always going to be negative. And it's still better than residential in terms of cash flow, but still something to consider up front. Yeah, well, what I what I say is that like what we need to do is we need to put put together a pay down strategy. So there needs to be an aggressive pay down strategy to pay down that deposit or the part of the deposit. So it could be twenty or thirty percent of the commercial property, or it could be just ten percent of the the residential property. But for a commercial property to do what it's supposed to do, which is cash flow. Um, there needs to be an aggressive pay down strategy if you're using all equity to buy that property. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, you can't keep it in the negative cash flow position for too long, especially if you're wanting to keep growing your portfolio in your own name and you've just borrowed, say, um, in, a, in, a, in a trust. All right, we've talked about this in a previous episode where if, if it's positive cash flow, or if it's self-sufficient and, and an accountant or you're a particular accountant will actually write and say that, that it's self-sufficient and able to meet its financial commitments, well, then we can exclude it from your personal borrowing capacity. But if you're carrying it and it's negative, well, the accountant's not going to put their name at risk and say that it's positive when it's not. So that's why you've got to have that strategy to get it into positive as quickly as you can. Yeah, 100%. And this is not like um, a magic formula. You will need outside money um, to be able to pay that down. The property is not going to be able to pay itself off. Um, so when I talk about an aggressive pay down strategy, that's outside funds from that asset, from the, from the actual property to be able to really um, keep putting down that, that cash. And then once you get it to a point where it's about 20 or 30% paid down, um, that's when the property will start doing what it's supposed to do, cash flowing. And um, you can kind of sit back and then start accumulating that cash either for another deposit or even paying down the loan even more. Um, but in terms of like um, interest rates or like, uh, you know, rates that we're going to be seeing for refinancing, say, a residential property right now, Victor, what, what would we see in the market right now? So at the moment, we're looking at sort of uh, mid to high sixes. And it's hard to know if that's going to continue or if there's going to be more rate rises before they start reducing. Uh, I think the, the the media out there is sort of changing the story quite a bit. Um, and then also we've got to consider global markets as well. So it's it's really hard to know exactly which way it's going to go. But 
I think it's good when you're doing your numbers to stress test it as well. I think maybe a, a general rule of thumb would be 1% above the current rate so that you're prepared for a few more rate rises. But it may not hit that, but it's always important to stress test it for yourself too. So like just your general feel of being in you know finance for so long, um, is your general feel that we're at somewhat at the top of where the interest rates could go and they'll start stabilizing in 2024? Um, what's I know this is like a bit of a prediction or you know take it with a grain of salt, but I just want to I want to understand how you feel about where we are in in the cycle of interest rates. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a good question because from my pers- or professional experience, I started in finance during the GFC. And in that period of time, there was aggressive rate hikes, similar to what we're going through right now. And from memory, we were hitting these sort of levels as well. Sort of that six, seven, I I believe I used to see 8% rates as well, but that was for for non-banks. And non-banks at the moment are sort of at that eight, nine percent anyway. So I think it's a fine line between if you go too high and no one can afford to buy anymore and the economy stops moving. So that's the game that they're playing, right? They want to reduce spending, but if they go too far and nobody can buy because they cannot because they can't borrow, well then another man's spending is another man's income. So then income starts to, you know, to drop across the board for everyone. And then unemployment starts to drop because people aren't receiving the income to pay staff. Uh, So therefore, it's a flow on effect. And as we know, you know, our entire economy is tied around property, you know, including state governments with stamp duty, including construction industry, which is a massive industry and how many tradies get employment Mm. and jobs. So it keeps Australia moving. So I don't think that my feel is that they're not going to push it so high that they're going to crash the entire market because nobody wins. So I do think we're sort of at that peak level because even right now, there's less and less people that um, can show borrowing capacity to even demonstrate what they currently owe. And these are people that can still comfortably feel like they can borrow again and buy something else. But according to the bank, they can't. And that's because of the stress test that exists right now is 3% above the current rate. So if you're borrowing at 7 and the bank's assessing at 10% principal and interest, well, mm. how many people can afford 10%, right? So that's why not many people can actually borrow, even though that's just to work out you know, their current loans. Once you throw on extra debt, yeah, it's, it's getting really, really tough at the moment. So yeah, I think we're definitely at that towards the peak it could be one or two left but others say that that's it what do you think and weren't they talking about i remember in a a previous episode um we were talking about how the the rate that they were actually going to assess you would only be one percent above the rate right now because of like just the the common sense factor um has that not come into play some in some instances, yes, but only for for big banks. APRA has given a, a special ruling for refinances uh, just to allow people to get out of the mortgage prison where they'll just give them a 1% buffer. That's a special circumstance. Not all banks, only a handful that allow that. Oh, okay. And then and a, and a couple of non-banks have adjusted their buffers to 1% uh, above actual. But the majority are still using 3%. Uh, so it, it's not official. So, you know, common sense, yeah, it makes sense. I agree with you. I only put three, uh, 1% because how how high could the rates go? But imagine they, they applied that two and a half years ago and they said, oh, yeah. let's only go up 1%. Like we'd be in a very different position right now <laughs> if, if they were lending people, oh, can they stress test 3%? Let's give them the money. And now we're sitting at six and above. Like that's that's a massive jump compared to what they calculate. They've already exceeded the stress test. Uh, 3% above, yeah. say 2% was like five, maybe five and a half. So now we're, we're above that. So you see why it exists. It's for that particular reason. 
Yeah, and are you, are you seeing, seeing or hearing that um, there are foreclosures and there's blood in the street where people are losing their houses? Because it's not really widely reported um, that that's actually happening, but I know that it, it somewhat is in the background. No, I'm actually not hearing anything like that right now. So I actually think that that hasn't happened because we had COVID where people were building up cash buffers. And people, yes, they were spending when they were able to, but they were also saving. People weren't able to travel to Europe or America or wherever they used to take their annual trips. And some of these trips can cost, you know, tens of thousands if you're a family. Um, And people um, were able to keep that in their offset accounts. So I do believe that there is some stress out there, but the reports that we're getting from banks and the data that they're sharing is it's a very, very low percentage of, of delinquencies. And my theory is that it's not just the fact that they're, they've got some cash to cover the, you know, the shortfall in the, in the mortgage repayments and they're adjusting their household budget. But I think it's my theory is that they're actually, people know what happened in COVID and that they said it was going to crash, but it did the opposite and prices went crazy. So because they know that, yeah. they don't want to exactly let go of their houses right now because they know if they can hang on for dear life, that eventually it will come back and they'll make up their money and more. So it is a buyer's market right now. So therefore, sellers aren't getting the prices that they want. So they the ones that can afford to hold it will hold it for as long as they can currently because they know if they can and whether this period they're going to make a lot more money so that's that's my theory what do you reckon yeah well there is definitely a a property boom um right around the corner um housing prices uh for residential and commercial um they haven't really gone down um it's more like stayed stable or, or gone up um there are a lot of great places and markets across australia with residential property particularly um that they've seen 8% growth in 2023 and 8% growth is classed as a property boom. It's just because it's not in Sydney or Melbourne, it's not widely reported. But there are so many different markets in Australia that are, uh, you know, officially booming with an 8% increase on last year on 2023. Um, and once interest rates start, do start stabilizing and there's a bit more clear, um, you know, sentiment in the market where people are sure that interest rates that have stabilized and they're going down. Um, there's going to be a flood of investors back to the market. Um, and that's only mm-hmm. going to push, uh, housing prices and commercial property prices up. Um, so, you know, there are some, uh, very, very good minds, uh, that have been looking at, um, you know, the property market, um, for a very long time. Um, and everything I'm reading and hearing and, and seeing um, points that there's going to be as a big property boom around the corner. Yeah, well, so there you go. More and more people are probably coming to that same conclusion and aren't in a rush to sell. <laughs> so good That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, mate, in terms of like refinancing, um, what are some of the asset types that people can use, like refinance their property to buy? I mean, it's not just property, um, surely. So can you just go through a couple of the different asset types that, you know, people do um, use the equity from their houses or their, you know, commercial properties um, to further their investments? Yeah, so I guess if you think about some examples, um, if someone's owner-occupied property has gone up in value, um, they want to buy another property, you know, Commercial one, as an example, I'm doing one right now. And they're sitting on about 300K in equity. So that 300K is to cover the deposit on a commercial property for 700,000. So that's able to cover a 45% deposit plus stamp duty plus buyer's agent fees and costs. So therefore, it becomes a staged scenario we we have to do a residential loan first ask the bank to refinance their existing loan and give them another 300k as as cash out and then what we do is we split the loan and we give them a second loan split for the cash out 
and we structure that as interest only. And the reason why we do it as interest only for the second loan, for the equity portion, is because they're not going to use that money straight away. It's going to sit there until they find the property that, they, that they're ready to buy, the next one. And they don't want to be paying, they don't want to be paying interest or making repayments until they've used the money. So by having an interest only loan and an offset account linked to it, they can essentially pre-borrow the money and have it sit there waiting until they're ready to use it. So that's a typical scenario that I work with. Um, and that money doesn't have to be used for residential. It can also be used for commercial properties. And what about other asset types? What, what, could, what else can we invest in? So when you say other asset type, you're talking about outside of property? Yeah, that's right. So like you could obviously refinance um, and you can ultimately use the money for pretty much whatever you want um, in some, most cases. So what are the other things that people do use yeah. their, their to like refinance cash that their line of credit for um, that's you know outside of the property realm? Yeah, so it depends on, on the client's investment strategy and what sort of help that they're getting and I guess also their um, experience. But if you, you also got to be mindful of what you tell the bank, right? Because what you tell them, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you can't untell them, right? So for example, if you told them you're wanting to invest into, into cryptocurrency, the bank's not going to agree to that because it's considered speculative and it's high risk. Um, it's borderline gambling. So banks don't want to support that. Um, if you're wanting to invest in, say, ETFs or manage funds or, you know, stocks, a bank will give you cash. They'll let you access that. But it all depends on how much you're asking for. You know, I've done cash outs for over a million dollars before. And, but not all banks will allow that. Some will cap it at, say, two or 300,000. And some will ask for evidence. Yep. So evidence, what, what can they provide to show that they're actually going to buy the shares or they're actually going to buy the ETFs? Do they have something from a financial advisor or an accountant to verify that? So yeah, that's usually the type of other investments you can put it into. In saying that, you know, it doesn't have to be income producing. Um, you can obviously use it to buy a car, right? Um, things like that, or even a holiday, I wouldn't suggest it. <laughs> Right, but uh, but but ultimately, once you have access to it, you can use it for whatever you like. Um, it's only if the bank controls it and, and they ask for evidence that they'll have to pay it to whatever you've decided to invest in. Yeah, it's it's interesting how like you've just got to kind of keep it a bit dark on what you you ultimately intend to use it for. Um, because you can use it for like renovations on your house, which would, you know, the bank actually um, in some cases will encourage that because um, it's obviously going back into the property, the asset that they're you know, securitizing. Um, but I thought it was funny when I was talking to a bank one time, they wouldn't allow me to refinance to buy commercial property, but they said, yeah, we're happy for you to buy a car. Um, that'd be cool. You know, I'm like, why would you try and like, why would you want me to buy a, a, a terrible asset like that? But you wouldn't want me to buy a real asset that produces cash flow that I could definitely like easily pay you back with. Like it's just those things that are like nuances. It's just you know, banking's a big business. They just want you to go further and further in debt and keep on paying interest. That's all they want yeah. you to do. Well, I can also tell you the reasoning why they couldn't help you release cash for a commercial property. It's because it's uh, the regulations. You've got consumer mm -hmm. lending and you've got commercial lending and they fall under two different umbrellas of regulation um consumer is you know home loans residential investment loans uh, personal loans personal car loans credit cards um and and even buy now pay later um whereas commercial is unregulated lending it's because unregulated means it's still regulated, but it's unregulated outside of the outside of the credit protection code, the NCCP, National Consumer Credit Protection. And 
it's a fine line that banks don't want to risk crossing because they're at, they get in trouble if they if they um, cross that line. So therefore, if they become aware that you intend on using it for commercial purposes, they'll just typically just say no. They they can actually do it, but there's a lot more more red tape and a lot more paperwork required where you have to sign off your rights and you know you have to prove that it is going to be used for commercial reasons under a commercial entity like a company or a trust. Um, and a lot of banks just don't have the, uh, I guess the, the other thing is they don't have the, the teams talking to each other. So like you have the retail side, which is your personal consumer lending. Then you have the commercial side, which is the business. Uh, and that's why you deal with business bankers and I deal a lot with them. And they don't usually talk to each other. And, and that's why when you tell them you're going to use a commercial, they just say, no, we can't do it. And it's and yeah. it's actually the same way with commercial lending. Bloody pain in the ass. If you went to a commercial right, so banker. How does like refinancing impact the overall cost of the loan long term? So it depends on the loan term you take out. So if you consider your, you know, your, your existing loan, say it has 25 years remaining and you approach the bank and you say, I want to access equity and refinance. Well, if you keep the loan term at 25 years, then that's actually going to be similar in terms of the amount of interest that you pay. It might even be better off because you're usually going to refinance to a lower rate. However, what you're doing if you do that way is you're reducing your borrowing capacity because the longer the loan term, the lower the repayments, higher, more interest you pay over time. And so therefore, if you're wanting to keep growing the portfolio, it may not make sense to keep your loan term 25 years, 22 years, you know, constantly paying it shorter and shorter. That's obviously good if you're wanting to reduce your interest and you're wanting to get out of debt. But if you're still in that growth stage, well, it makes more sense to actually reset the loan term over 30 years and to do the same with the equity. Sorry, yeah, do the same with equity and do the same with the next purchase. Um, so that's that's sort of the, the main impact, the overall interest that you pay over the time. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention was more around the interest-only structure. But, but actually, sorry, the fees. So each time you refinance, you have to pay fees, right? There's going to mm-hmm. be uh, discharge fees, so the bank that you're currently with or the lender you're with are going to charge a discharge fee. If it's residential lending, it's typically about you know 250 up to 400 bucks. Uh, that can be per property sometimes. Uh, then there's also government fees. That's around 300 bucks thereabouts. And then uh, the new bank or lender may also charge an application fee or establishment fee. So I usually estimate around 1,000 to 1,200 bucks just to switch a residential to residential but commercial there's more fees um establishment yep. fees exit fees uh valuation fees so it may not be that feasible to constantly refinance commercial loans because it's just expensive and and in your view when should you actually like look at your loan like how many how how frequently should you be looking at your loan to potentially refinance? So it depends on how on top you are of how competitive your rate rates are at any given time. So if, if you sit back and just assume that the bank is always going to give you a competitive rate, it's highly likely that, you know, especially in the last 18 months, that your rates have gone above what new customers, new to bank customers are getting. So it's worthwhile just checking with your broker um, to see if your rate is still competitive. Um, There's a misconception out there that your broker knows what your rates are and will always uh, get you a better rate at any given time because before the loan settles, we, the broker, are the customer to the bank. Once it settles, you're the customer to the bank. So that means that we don't have the same level of authority that we had at the beginning once it settles. Mm. So we can't 
always just call up the bank on your behalf and get information to know what your interest rate is um, and what your new repayments are and what your balance are. Some banks will give us access, but the majority don't. So therefore, you need to stay on top of that more than more than the broker. There are some technology, and I'll talk more about that later, but but at the moment, if if you log in and you see your interest rate and you check with your broker to see if there's a better deal out there, that's the time to refinance. But it all depends on how long you've had the loan as well. So you want to at least have a year or two with your existing loan before you switch it. A um, few reasons for that. Um, what you could do is actually call your existing bank or your broker can do it and request that they review your rate uh, for retention purposes. So that means if as long as you've been on top of your repayments and you're a good customer, that bank should be able to reduce your rate at least slightly. It may not be exactly what the bank, what they offer new clients, but they should give you some sort of reduction to keep it competitive. And then once you get to sort of 12 months or two years, then at that point, it's probably time to refinance. Um, but the other time you'd want to look into it would be when you're wanting to access equity. So we talked about different types of assets you can invest in. But if you're growing your portfolio, then that's the time when you need to know who's going to give you the most equity. And it all depends on the valuations. So you might not stick with the same bank. You might actually have to switch to another bank that gives you a higher valuation to allow you to access more equity than the other than the one that you're already with. So that's another time to review it, time that you're actually looking at pulling the trigger and actually buying something else. Yeah, fair enough. It'd be really good if um, you know, you had being the broker, every single loan that you wrote, you'd have it in a portal and you could see it like in real time what interest rate they were charging you. So you could basically just go, boop, 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 boop. yep, yep. Okay, let's uh, um, fix that one, change that one. Let's call the customer here, like bang, bang, bang. And you could stay on top of it and really like, you know, basically managing a uh, a book of, um, you know, investments then, um, which would be really cool. But like, so like yeah. nowadays, what would you consider a good interest rate? What's a good interest rate for a, a residential house? Um. A good interest rate would be low sixes. So between 6.09 to 6.3, even 6.4. Okay. If you got the rate at that, you, you, you're pretty right. good. Yeah, okay. So what's, uh, what's your uh, commercial-wise as well? What, what would be a good interest rate for commercial right now? Um, mid to high sixes. So between six and a half to sort of 6.8, 6.9, that's a pretty good commercial rate. Anything above that, it's usually the higher LVR stuff and the non-bank stuff. But if it's a typical, yeah, right. you know, 60, 65%, mid to high sixes. Well, I'm just going to log into um, one of my loan accounts, and this is the the loan that um, that you moved for me, Victor. The one that um, we got a line of credit out against. I'm just opening up the account now um, for the offset account. Oh yeah, so it's actually uh, six point oh four um, percent um, that it's up to variable. So it's right on bang with a good interest rate right now. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that was a close one. <laughs> what about I'll, I'll check the line of credit what's the line of credit at hang on a second this is on my phone oh the line of credit obviously what would what would a good interest rate be for a line of credit so it's probably around six and a half six point six all right so we're doing not very good for our line of credit then it's at seven point one four okay uh, after this uh, recording, I'm going to see if I can get you a discount. <laughs> it's so good. It's, so good. it's not changing my life much. But yeah, it'd be good to try and fix it up, but that's okay. Anyway, that's good. Um, no, I'm glad we did that. That's fun. Um, so, mate, in terms of like um, 
like, uh, hang on, where are we going to go to? Um, okay. In terms of like implications between like interest only and P and I, um, would you ever take out equity, a line of credit, and have a P and I uh, loan against that, like using it as a P and I loan instead of interest only? Mm. It's not common. Uh, it depends on your personal circumstances. So, if you're if you're at a point where you're wanting to pay back debt and you don't really have much you can claim against your personal mm -hmm. taxes anymore, um, it would make sense to actually just do P&I on the equity as well as the main loan. Um, I think that's probably the only circumstances. Interest only makes more sense because if you're carrying personal debt, like a, per, like a home loan, um, it may, you'd actually want to direct all your principal payments to that first because that's not tax deductible. So if you're doing P&I on your home loan and you're doing P&I on your investment loan at the same time, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot because the principal payments that you're making on the investment loan are reducing your interest and the interest is what's deductible, not the principal payments. So whereas the principal on your owner occupied, it's not deductible. So therefore that principal that you've been paying the in investment, should, you could have directed that to the owner occupied, that extra repayment. So that's why it's only if you've, you're out of owner occupied debt, you, your home's paid off, you haven't taken out any equity on it. Um, or even if you have, it's all investment debt. Well, there's no point in keep carrying debt. It's going to have to be paid off eventually, right? So you should then pay principal and interest for it. Um, but it also helps your borrowing capacity um, with bigger banks to have P&I and not interest only. So I'm, I want to just, you know, re-emphasize that it's for big banks. And when I say big banks, I'm talking about uh, the big four plus, you know, this, um, you know, your INGs, your Suncorps, your Macquarie's as well. As soon as you start going to non-bank land, they actually penalize you for P&I. What I mean by penalize is they let you borrow less. So if you did a principal and interest over 30 years or you did interest only for, say, five years and then 25 years remaining, that can actually um, hinder your borrowing capacity with a non-bank because they look at the interest only repayment when they calculate their serviceability or their borrowing capacity. Whereas big banks, um, what they're also called is ADIs, authorized deposit taking institutions. Um, what they do is they'll look at the remaining P and I term. So if you did say five years interest only, 25 years left, they'll stress test 25 years P and I rather than 30. So having a five-year interest only can be detrimental to your borrowing capacity for bigger bank lending. So that's what I mean. It all depends. This is where I come in because obviously I need to look at things strategically and consider that what where they're at now uh, and what impact it will have for the next move because usually they don't want to stop with the next transaction. So having a great interest rate, long-term interest only, may not be the right move for you right now because it might stop you from getting into the next property. Yeah, interesting. So what are some of the misconceptions or the common misconceptions about like transferring a loan to a different lender? Is there like anything that you always come across where it's like that's, you know, just wrong, like that doesn't work, that doesn't how it is? Mm, yeah. Well, I think probably the misconception is it's probably that it's too hard. Uh, they think that it's yep. a lot of effort. and Because remember when you buy a property for the first time, there's a lot of moving parts, right? You're signing contracts, you're meeting agents, you're doing inspections, you're talking to conveyances, doing contract reviews, building inspections. So they people remember that they had to do all that when they got the loan. So then sometimes they think they have to do a lot of that again, but they don't. All of that's done. They already own the property. So refinance is actually much simpler. They just have the same property and one lender now pays out the other one. 
um it's just a so then when i explain that to them they're like okay that makes sense it's actually not that complicated and and then the other misconception is is that it's expensive so when people think oh if i have to pay a thousand dollars and new fees then they think that that's actually not worth refinancing but when you weigh up the difference between <laughs> the interest on the new loan um the interest on the new loan and what the fees would be uh, and add the fees versus the interest on the old loan they're actually better off the repayments are less interest is less so it makes more sense to actually refinance yeah, you could imagine like the the life of that loan, what it would cost to stay in the original um, product that's at a higher interest rate. It could be like tens of thousands of dollars difference, uh, even hundreds of thousands of dollars difference. And then people are like, okay, um, I don't want to move over because it's a thousand dollar cost. Like it's just like really just short term, like short minded thinking, um, not not understanding yeah. the full picture. Uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, actually, there's one more, um, and that is it's too hard to switch up, switch all my direct debits um, and have new cards and have new <laughs> BSB and account numbers and all, all that stuff, transfers. I think, oh, I don't want to do it. That's too much of a headache. Well, if you spent an hour doing it and it saves you 10 grand a year, <laughs> what would you rather, <laughs> right? And I think that's that's another thing that people also convince themselves that it's too hard. It's not difficult to change your direct debits. I had my 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 card recently that someone, you know, nearly accessed my money, but then the bank blocked it, and I had to, you know, set them all up again. Like it didn't take me long. You know, I just jumped online and I checked one by one, updated the card, done. <laughs> like it took me a few minutes. Right? <laughs> And I think this is what the banks actually want um, people to feel like. I guess they they make it as hard as possible to move, um, or give you the the misconception that it is hard to move because they obviously want you to stay. Um, and um, yeah, I definitely think that that's a a bit of a tactic, um, you know, or like uh, you know what they actually want. So can you just walk mm. us through exactly? Um, the the process of moving a loan to another lender and and how it might how, and how it is simpler than you think because for me when you helped me out with one of my loans um you pretty much did everything like I you know didn't really do too much I mean I did obviously put fill out all the documents um put everything together which you know probably did take me about an hour and a half two hours one one uh, evening to get everything loaded into your portal um but after that. I was pretty much out of the picture and just getting emails saying this is happening, this is done, this is you know bang bang bang, you know. So can you just explain mm -hmm. the whole process of, of moving to another lender? Yeah, well, I mean, you you sort of hit the nail on the head, right? It's only at the beginning that you had to do the work, and the rest of it I handled. So if you consider um, the borrower, all they're really doing is filling out their details. And I do have a portal, an electronic portal, rather than an old form that you have to fill out and print and sign and all that. You fill out in your own time. And this is your address history, uh, employment history, your assets, liabilities, your expenses. And then I have a custom document list that you need to upload. And I only ask for the minimum. So depending on which lender we're going to, many times we don't even need that much. We just need pay slips, tax return, ID, and uh, the loan statements for your debts. So if you can get all that, then I gather it all. I check it all. I make sure that it all meets the criteria of the bank and you know, I'm doing my due diligence um, as a broker. And then I package all that up and send it to you to sign. Customer would sign it um, electronically as well. So e-sign, DocuSign, and then I submit that to the bank, whoever that bank is. And then that bank checks it all. Um, if it all st oh, sorry, there's also valuation required at some point or another. But the good news is that a lot of the time it's desktop valuations. So you don't even need to send out an independent valuer to your house. And the bank accepts that. 
they tick it all off, they approve it. And then at that point, you sign a discharge form. Uh, so you as the borrower or customer, you sign a discharge form with your current bank to notify them that you're switching and you give authority for that new bank to communicate with the old bank and allow them to you know, pay out the other and allow them to transfer the mortgage and the title to the next, uh, next bank. So that's why you didn't really have to do anything until you heard back later and said, okay, it's been approved. Now you need to sign these documents. So then you sign a letter of offer, which is a loan agreement, you sign a discharge form, gets sent to the bank. They check it. You might need to update your insurance. So if you have a, a stand, um, uh, you know, detached house, not strata, then you'll need to call your insurance company to make sure that the, um, you know, insurance policy shows the new bank as the interested party. And then you just have to allow that bank to pay out the other one. That's pretty much it. And then it settles. You have access to new net banking, new cards, and then you start setting up all your direct debits uh, and pay your, of your salaries into your new bank accounts. And that's it. Nice and easy. And if you access yeah. equity, you'd also see that available on net banking. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, it is a pain in the ass to have to set up all like the new bank accounts and change all the direct debits from a new like uh, expense account or whatever. But, you know, in that instance, we were drawing out 100K that I was using for another investment. Um, you know, so it was well worth it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, um, you know, for a, exactly. for a little bit of time, um, I'll I'll take a hundred k for a, you know, to say let's just say accumulatively like three hours of work, I'll take a hundred k every day. <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> you know, I don't know. People are like, oh, I'd rather not spend the three hours and not keep growing my portfolio and not have access to cash. Yeah, that's it. Like, why? Yeah, funny. Right, where are we going to now? Hang on, let me just find a good question for. Do you know? You, I'm sure you realize that it's a little bit laggy. I can. I sometimes can't hear you talk, and then it comes back to you, and I'm just waiting for you to finish. Yeah. Same. You're aware of that? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. So here we go. All right, mate. So, what are the some of what are some of the the risks and pitfalls uh, associated with um, refinancing, and and how can they be mitigated? Okay. So, I guess the risks would be. Um, I guess the the real risk is not if you execute, and if you follow through, and then realize that you. It wasn't, it wasn't the most competitive product or it wasn't the right product for you or the structure wasn't correct. So like, but I don't know how often it actually happens. It's probably more often if, if somebody goes directly to the bank and, and not through a broker, especially one that specializes uh, with, with property investors. Uh, but say, for example, interest only, if somebody you know, was accessing equity, but they didn't do it as interest only they can't just change it over later. Once it settles, they have to apply for a new loan again. So they have to actually do that at the beginning. So that's why I would say it's worthwhile understanding the structure, educating yourself, and also talking to your broker about it before you you know, you know, hit go um, so that you're 100% certain on the structure before you, you submit anything. Um, and then the, the cost factor... Look, many times people refinance because they want a better deal. And the broker sends them a comparison and says, this is, you know, these are the rates you can get. Well, that may not be the only product you can get. That's just the one that broker is recommending due to, you know, your objectives and also due to them being comfortable using those lenders. So if you want to also do your own research, if it's all about price, well, it's worthwhile telling that broker, is this actually the most competitive on the market? Because otherwise, I will probably want to look into it further. So then they might present to you options that they're not necessarily used to using. They might go to a bank that 
it's not someone that they're comfortable using. But because you've made that clear that you're all about the rate and the lower fees, then they have to consider using a lender that they, they you know, more often than not don't use. Or maybe they've never used them. Um, so there's that. And I guess the other risk is saying too much. You know, when we're talking about earlier, you can't unsay certain things. So you want to have the communication with your broker uh, and be clear about what's going to be presented to the bank that's going to, you know, allow you to get the outcome. So when you sit down at a branch and you start opening up about all your plans, that may not be the best thing for you in case you're doing uh, something that, you know, the bank won't lend you money for. Um, but, of course, you want to use your equity to benefit your own financial future. So you need to work with, with lenders that will support that. Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, I reckon that, for me, one of the biggest risks that I would, would think that this is probably the biggest risk is the misuse of the funds if you are refinancing, taking out a line of credit, and it's the misuse of those funds for things that aren't actually building your wealth, like buying more real estate. Um, and if you use that, um, those funds for like, you know, just to spend on, you know, things like that are material possessions that are just liabilities, they don't actually, you know, help your life and you can't resell them and you just end up frittering all of that money away um, that you've drawn out as a line of credit and now you've just got a bigger loan um, that you're paying down without any, you know, nothing, nothing to show for it. I reckon the misuse of funds um, would be a massive thing because not everyone um, is, uh, you know, uh, really, really highly financially educated um, on the types of assets they could be using. So they could be using it for, for shares and things like that. And, you know, shares can go to zero, um, unfortunately. So it's a bit more of a, a risky game um, that you're playing. So I think misuse mm -hmm. of funds would be one of the ones that I would think of. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, you know, the types of clients that I talk to are typically a bit more um, savvy and they're a bit more educated before they take on that risk. Um, but also I have to filter that too, right? Because I have the right to say, no, I don't want to work with certain people too, right? And if I get the feel that they're not, you know, the right type of customer to to access hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash, well, then I won't support that application. <laughs> so it's like I have to then decide as well. Um, so, but typically, you know, if someone does want to access a lot of equity and they've got a lot of personal debt, well, I would say it makes sense to consolidate that first. So consolidation doesn't give them access to the cash. So what I mean by that is if they're going to pay off a $50,000 car loan um, or credit cards, well, the bank will want to control that. So then they'll release the money and actually pay out those debts directly. And if they don't yeah. and they do give them access, that's when I ask the client to make sure they send me a letter to confirm it's been paid in full because that's part of my due diligence to make sure that they're going to be in a better position. And then whatever's left, then they can invest it. But if they've just freed up a whole bunch of cash flow by clearing all these personal debts and loans and stuff, well, they're in a better position because their outgoings have reduced. All right. So now they actually can think clearer and actually make some more investment decisions because they're not constantly, you know, maxed out and paying, you know, all their disposable income to paying off personal debt at high rates. So, yeah, that comes into effect as well. And how do you see like, um, you know, refinancing property changing in the future? Are there any like emerging technologies or trends or like AI that, um, you know, banks are, are using now to, to submit these applications, to review these applications? Is there anything like futuristic coming through the, the woodwork that we're going to, it's going to change the landscape of how we refinance property in future? Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting time we're in at the moment, right? We've got a lot of emerging technology. Um, you know, we've got AI that's coming up. We've got um, open banking. 
And open banking, I think, will probably be the thing that's uh, when it starts to work well, it will make it easier and faster for 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 um, clients to refinance because it just means that the transparency of their transactions and their repayment history will be, you know, they just electronically consent and they don't have to log into net banking, download statements, try to get the exact dates, transaction histories and send that and get the bank to manually check everything. It's the, you know, when that it is integrated well with um, with the credit bureaus, so Equifax and um, what happens is they can see automatically that you've been on time for the last 12 months or low or more. So then they'll happily just pay that bank out. And if they've got your open banking consent, well, they can see the BSB and account number and they can just pay it directly. And there's already electronic title systems, not in all states, but the majority of all states called PEXA, P-E-X-A. And this is where you don't have a physical title of your of the title deed anymore. It's just an electronic transfer that happens through this system. And the banks share it and the state governments share it and the titles office share it. And that's why you have seamless transactions already happening electronically uh, when you're when you're refinancing and when you're purchasing. But once you sort of you know put open banking and you know integrate the credit history in there as well, um, what what will then inevitably happen is that they're going to start to review your affordability through these means too. They haven't done that yet. They still require pay slips, and they still um, you know require you to declare your expenses. But at some point or another, they are most likely going to say, give us consent so we can see your, your banking data and your loan history. And then we'll see how much money you really have left over after you spend all your money. <laughs> and do you actually have enough to afford the loan? And if you do, we'll lend you the money. And if you don't, we won't. You see, that's where we're probably going to get to. Um, a lot of fintechs are already using that in the car finance and personal loan space. But in mortgages and commercial loans, uh, a bit slower. Yeah, so I guess there's absolutely no hiding in future, um, no cooking the numbers a little bit just to get that little bit more finance over the line. Um, so, you know, what I'm hearing you say is get as much finance as you can right now before those technologies come, uh, you know, to fruition. Um, because when they do, um, you, there's no hiding. There's, you're never getting away from it. You're not going to be uh, getting yeah. approved for anything that you shouldn't be getting approved for, and um, that would be a, a, a horrible thing. Well, one of our uh, early episodes, we talked about how to prepare before you start borrowing money, right? And I think that's probably more prevalent now because if you can get on the front foot and start managing your money so that you always spend less than you earn and save the difference, then when it comes time to uh, apply for a loan with these technologies, you'll be like, here, I'll happily share it with you. <laughs> See that I'm good with my money. Because remember, it can work in your favor. Because remember, the banks use um, what's called the HEM, the Household Expenditure Measure. So they're guessing how much you spend based on your household income, based on where you live, uh, based on how many people are in the household, including kids. And even if you spend less than that, they're still using the higher of the two. But in the future, mm. if you can show them you're spending less than that cons consistently, they'll have no reason to use the higher. They'll, have a, they'll, they'll say, well, the data tells me you're spending three grand, even though my estimates are four and a half. So that can work in your favor. But if you are spending four and a half or five grand, well, forget about it. It's worked against you. <laughs> so that's why. <laughs> Get ahead. <laughs> No, that, that's a good point. Get your get your ducks in order right now um, for when this scary technology does uh, come online because there's no hiding. Um, Big Brother will get you. All right, mate. Well, this has been a fantastic series. Um, really, really happy we got this um, got this done. Um, you know, it's been they've been like few and far between. Um, there's only been six episodes, but it's been very, very fun. So, I, uh, I thanks for uh, uh, joining me. Um, and doing these series, mate. Um, anything, any final words? No, it's been great. Um, I've had some really positive feedback. 
from the listeners, um, you know, people have connected with yourself and me, and we've been able to help more and more clients get onto the uh, commercial property ladder. And um, yeah, I think, you know, keep, keep at it. I think at some point I'm going to have you on my interview on my podcast as well, because I really want you to share more of your story <laughs> about self storage uh, and how we can help more people tap into that. Cause it is, uh, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts. It's not as simple as a, a regular property. So I think if we can find a way to help more people, uh, that's what it's all about. That's it, man. And we, we will have Victor on back again, um, I'd imagine. Um, you know, so don't feel like uh, he's going anywhere, but just for this particular series, um, we're, we're going to close it up. But, uh, you know, there could be a reboot. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? So yeah, this has been the Financial Expert... <laughs> well, this has been financial expert Vic Salagos and Andrew Bean on the Financial Freedom Series. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>